My name is Greg Mankiw. I'm a professor of economics at Harvard University. So we usually assume that people are doing the best they can. Now, it's of course true that people aren't always rational in the world. The assumption that people are rational is a working hypothesis. Economists find a, a useful working hypothesis to assume that people are doing the best they can. But we also recognize that that's not always the case. And I think economists differ in the extent to which they think people adhere to the rationality assumption and to what extent they deviate from rationality. But I think all economists agree that thinking through what rational decision making looks like in any given environment is a useful, useful starting point for understanding the decisions that people make. A lot of economic decision making is based on costs and benefits. But when thinking about costs and benefits, the term costs is not as obvious as it might first appear. And economists spend a lot of time thinking about the term costs and what is a cost and what isn't a cost. And you'll see economists talk about the different notions of cost. Opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is a big idea in economics. The opportunity cost of something is what you give up to get it. It might sound simple, but it's not as simple as it first appears. What is the opportunity cost of going to college? You might think the cost of going to college is the tuition, room, and board that you pay to the university. But that's not really the case. Because, first of all, room and board, well, you're going to have to eat. You're going to have to have some place to live, even if you don't go to college. The biggest opportunity cost of going to college is the time that you spend going to college. The foregone earnings that you have to give up because you're spending time in the classroom studying rather than working at a job. So that's an example of opportunity cost. So think about, about the opportunity cost of going to college. You've got to think about the cost of your time, what you're giving up, wages at a job in order to spend time uh, in the classroom. Another idea of cost is a sunk cost. And a sunk cost to an economist is a cost that's not really a cost. Let me explain what I mean by that. A, a sunk cost is a cost that you've incurred in the past and that you really can't recover. And therefore, going forward, it's not really an opportunity cost. I'll give you an example of that. You're going to a, a movie theater. You said you, you, the movie theater ticket costs $10. You're really excited to go to the movie because you value seeing this new movie at $15. So you, the reason you decide to go is the benefit, $15, as you judge it, is bigger than the cost, the $10 of the ticket. Now suppose that as you're about to walk into the movie theater, you look in your pocket and say, darn, I, the ticket fell out of my pocket. I lost it. I can't, I can't find the ticket. What should you do? Should you say, gosh, I'm not going to go to the movie then, because if I have to go, I have to buy another ticket, and that would be a total of $20, and that's greater than the benefit that I would get, which is the $15. Nope, that's not the ra rational decision. And the reason it's not the rational decision is the, the $10 for the ticket that you lost is a sunk cost. You can't get that $10 back. It's gone. It's not an opportunity cost of going to the uh, movies anymore. It's what economists call a sunk cost. And when thinking about whether to go to the movie, you should ignore sunk costs. So those are two of the kinds of costs that economists emphasize. Opportunity costs, which is where you give up to get something, which is the, the true cost of something, and a sunk cost, which is something that's already been lost, can't be recovered, and therefore is not really a cost anymore. It's, it's, it's easy to, for, to tell people you should ignore sunk costs, and therefore, because sunk costs are not no longer opportunity costs, but they may not feel that way. They may feel like, oh, a sunk cost is a real cost. They may feel bad about having incurred it. 
but that's not really the rational way to approach a decision. And what economists do is they explain to people what the rational decision is. Ignoring sunk costs, focusing on opportunity costs is the right way to do that. One of the big revolutions in economics in the past 150 years is that what's called the marginal revolution. If you go back to the early economics textbooks, those written in the um, 18th century or early 19th century, the word marginal doesn't show up. If you look at a modern textbook, the word marginal shows up all the time. So what does marginal mean? It means changes around the edges of what you're always doing. The word margin means edge, and marginal means changes around the edge of what you're doing. I have to give you an example. You know, you're deciding, you're sitting down at dinner, and you're deciding, should I take another helping of that mashed potatoes? If you like mashed potatoes, should you get another spoonful? That's a marginal decision. You're deciding to take one more spoonful of mashed potatoes. When you sit down to eat dinner, you don't say to yourself, should I fast today, or should I eat like a pig? That, that would not be a marginal change. That's not a decision that most people think about dinner. You say, I'm going to have dinner, and I have to decide, should I get that extra spoonful of mashed potatoes? Should I get the extra helping of dessert? That's a marginal decision. It's a small change around the edges of what you're doing. And that, that big, uh, big, big idea of economics, that idea of marginal changes, is really important for thinking about optimization. When you're deciding, when your company deciding what price to charge for your product, deciding how many uh, workers to hire, when you're deciding how much uh, capital to invest, you're always deciding that at the margin. You're always kind of making small incremental changes around your, the plan of action that you're, that you're engaged in at that moment. And that's what marginal analysis is. It's trying to understand those incremental changes. As you study economics, you'll see the idea of marginal analysis uh, pervade the field. Economists normally assume that people are rational. And rational means they're doing the best they can in the environment they face. So they could be a firm that's trying to maximize profit, profit subject to the market conditions that it, it faces. It could be a consumer or household deciding to maximize what economists call utility an abstract notion of satisfaction. They're trying to maximize satisfaction when they go to the store and buy a bundle of goods or when they go to the marketplace and, and, and supply their labor. I think consumers are doing their best. They're trying to be rational in most cases, but it, it's not always easy, even with the ad advent of things like the internet and modern technology. We certainly have a lot of tools available to us on the internet and elsewhere to help with decision making. But I think one of the things we've learned is that the internet also includes some things that are not true, some things that are false. And misinformation can spread over the internet as well as correct information. So I think the biggest challenge to people trying to make rational decisions is trying to filter out misinformation from valid information. And that's true both when you're thinking about political decisions on who to vote for, and you're thinking about personal decisions like what, what product to buy. Because you know, there's some producers out there that are selling great products, and there's some producers out there that aren't. But the real constraint on rational decision making is not the ability to access information in the modern economy. The real constraint on rational decision making is the human cognitive capacity to think through problems, to figure out what's true and what's false, and to make rational inferences from uh, statements that we believe to be true. So I, I think human uh, capacity, human cognitive capacity, is really the limit on, on rational decision making. You know, in, the, in recent years, there's been a huge explosion of work on what's called behavioral economics, which is a, a field that didn't exist when I was a student, but it's, it's a very big field today. And it's basically economists recognizing that psychology is very useful in understanding human behavior. And so economists have been venturing away from the rationality assumption, 
towards understanding ways in which humans are more complex than a rational decision maker might be. Studying economics does help people make somewhat more rational decisions. So for example, if you're investing your retirement savings, you'll learn in economics the value of diversification. Uh, and you'll be a more rational investor, having studied a little bit of economics. But we economists recognize that people aren't always rational and therefore they sometimes deviate from rationality and will we figure out ways in which we can nudge them in the direction to make somewhat more rational decisions. E economists have preached diversification for a long time. We, we can have laws that make diversification the default. We can say when you save for your retirement, automatically your money will go into well-diversified funds as opposed to say putting all the money into the uh, stock of your employer. A mistake that, that people make time and time again is when they save for retirement, they think, I work for a great firm. I'm going to put all my money in the stock of my firm. That seems like a tempting thing to do. It's tempting, I think, because you feel like, oh, I work there. If something bad was going to happen, I would know it because you work there. But that's not really true. It's very easy to not understand everything that's going on in your firm. It's very easy for even a great firm to make some big mistake, lose lots of money. And you see time and time again when a firm goes bankrupt, a small number of employees have excessively invested in that company. And as a result, you see not only they're losing their job because the firm's going under, but they also lose much of their life savings. Big mistake. All economists understand that's a big mistake. And so what economists can do is, first we can teach people that's a big mistake to try to well, get them to not do it. But in addition, we can also help policymakers pass laws to prevent people from making that mistake by requiring, or at least making as a default, broad diversification as the way to invest retirement savings. Keep studying economics, and please, uh, keep watching this program. Uh, thank you very much.